Hi there, Ed. Hey, how's it going? All right. Mark and I were oh, just checking in. Good. Good. Go. My login had been any slower, I would have been going backwards. There seems to be a cluster of uh, technical issues uh, that are occurring around us. Really? <laughs> 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 it's, just, it's hard to find where to find everything. It, yeah. <laughs> On top of everything else, Mark. <laughs> you no, know, a suggestion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's possible, but when there's an uh, event, uh, a live event or whatever, however these things are, Maybe that could be at the top of the page, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. it takes it takes me a while to find mm -hmm. the Cosmos Cafe Zoom link. It's just like I don't know what's going on. Serious? That's okay. No, that's a good suggestion. Uh, no, no. actually, yeah. Isn't that basic like one hundred and one? Well, it one hundred and one. For Am what? I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. exactly. Web, whatever this, you know. I am. Well, there's a there's a method and a madness, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a kind of organic assemblage, a bricolage, if you will, <laughs> of, of components uh, to mm -hmm. this whole web platform. Uh, yeah, which, yeah. You know, is a work in progress. Let's just say that. Yeah. And and they all and that's the thing, Mark. They all are. Every one of them is a work in progress. <laughs> so you have to get in. You have to like mold your own and somehow form it to to get what you want. So you know, it is a good suggestion. I'd I'd like to be able to just go onto the page and say, "Oh, right there at the top, that's where I want to go." But um, if you do that. There are so many other things that will be sacrificed. <laughs> Not necessarily. I mean, I, I imagine, and Caroline and I have talked about the idea of a, a kind of dashboard, which would be uh, an uh, overlay to uh, the yeah. various websites and would kind yeah. of be, would be personalized, you know, as yeah. are yeah. showing you the events that are you're interested in or the topics that you're following uh, and yeah. allowing you to dig deeper and to explore what else is going on in the more chaotic, sort of frothy, uh, uh, you know, un untamed uh, discussion uh, spaces, but uh, otherwise would be relatively narrowed and filtered uh, yeah. to, you know, maintain some, some sanity, some signal-to-noise ratio. Um, yeah, but that's what we're working towards, and we just need a lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's or just time. Clear. Time is money. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. so you know, I I learned that equations go both ways. You know, so <laughs> yeah. Hi there, John. Hello, <clears throat> greetings. And Doug. Hi, Doug. Uh, Doug. Doug's muted. Doug. Yeah. Hello. Today. I have gusts of wind and uh, music playing in the background, so I don't know if uh, you guys prefer silence over chaos, but hello, everyone. Are you doing it on your phone? I am. So you My, can do it on your phone. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a, theoretically, that's possible, I've heard. <laughs> I've got a few of these. Yeah, I'm plugged in, so hopefully I won't disappear today. Uh, How, how's the sound right now with uh, being unmuted? Is it okay? Yeah, there's Not a little much. bit of tingle tangle in the background. But... Some music playing. It sounds yeah. like jazz. Sure, why not? <laughs> I don't know. An old show tune or something. Uh, no, it sounds like contemporary pop jazz, maybe. Uh, Couldn't tell you the tune. <laughs> Is Zach joining us today? Well. I should hope so. <laughs> he, he just messaged. He said, if you can, like 10 minutes ago, if you can believe it, our babysitter just called in sick, and I'm having trouble with my internet. 
So having to send this from the gym Wi-Fi near us. I thought uh, that was Dave that said on. that. Dave, that's what I meant. That's what I was saying. That there has been a cluster of technical issues. Gotcha. Uh, that, Dave, preceding uh, Zachary, uh, he wasn't able to make it yesterday. Dave to the other meeting we had, and apparently Zachary can't make it today. And how ironic! Yes, since <laughs> technology is our baby, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's our progeny, isn't it lovely? <laughs> yeah, it's like Rosemary's baby. No, no. <laughs> so you can now look into the face of your biological child and say, "You're not as smart as a computer." <laughs> but I, I thought I thought you, you might have some strong reactions to this piece. <laughs> so we should get them all out, huh? Well, I'm not shaking in my boots anytime soon. <laughs> Computers are going to take away my expertise. Um, if you know, it depends on what you want to define expertise as. But I have much higher standards, I suppose, mm -hmm. than most people who are talking about the technological uh, singularities is surpassing us. <clears throat> uh, but the ones that do feel like they're going to be surpassed by a uh, are probably are going to be surpassed at the rate they're acquiring any knowledge. Because I think, um, you know, the, the attention span is so um, fragmented in most people. And their uh, identity formation is so flawed that um, some of the worst case scenarios probably will happen. I mean, but I don't think that's, I think there's still people who are uh, moving for me, it's such, it's so, such a, the body and the mind are so much more complex than anything computers are going to be able to match, since computers are basically produced in very um, low intensity, low complexity environments. Mm -hmm. So to think that they're going to surpass us is to, uh, you know, it's like shooting yourself in the foot and trying to run a relay race. It's really absurd. Mm -hmm. But I'm really open to other perspectives here. And I know Zach is talking about the human singularity, uh, which I think he's trying to differentiate from the, the other kind of singularity. That Kurt, uh, that uh, White, Kurzweil, what's his name? Ray Kurzweil. He's going to load his consciousness into a, just sounds like Silicon Valley snake oil to me, but there are, going, there are a lot of people who are buying it. That's for sure. I, uh, I just watched a uh, HBO show for the first time this morning, West, Word, West World. It's based on a Michael Crichton film he did back in the 80s. Has anybody else seen it? It's on this very subject. Mm -hmm. No, I've, I've not seen it. Well, I highly, I highly recommend it. Uh, there's a second season coming out soon of Westworld. Yeah. Have you seen it? The first, yeah. I thought the first season was very well done. And um, it's not necessarily about the the Ray baby, the Ray Kurzweil's baby that he's working on. It's it's more from, yeah, it's, it's really exploring consciousness in general. And I think they do a stellar job of that. Well, and the computer taking over. Uh, mm -hmm. If I, it, it, you know, you go into a a world, uh, basically back into the old West, through, and they build robots, this corporation, and then people, actual humans, pay money to go into the West world, and of course, then they live out their fantasy whatever the fantasy is, but it is organic. And there, there's a, he says, uh, uh, the place, this place is the answer to that question, who you really are, which I think Zachary is trying to get to, have a, some sort of a, a test for people. If you're going to be in leadership, you have to score at least 7.5 on a 10-point scale to even throw your hat into the ring. 
but so he wants a Zachary wants a he wants the real person to be exposed, and that and he I think in in the beginning of the paper he's talking about that this this medium this new thing social media has exposed people like who they really are uh and you know my impression of that is it's not pleasant this is my, my opinion of people in general has gone down <laughs> you mean like donald trump and, and, and he's a no no, Big gal, what's your name? <laughs> Donald Trump is... You're not shocked, are you? I hope. ...is uh, high on the list. But in, in back, to the, back to the West world, so rich people get to spend their money and go in, and it's going back like in the Old West. And the... the sort of the underlying theme here is that yeah rich white men are really bad when you get down to it (laughs) (laughs) because they live out their fantasies fantasies which is basically you know doing whatever they want which is a lot of killing and maiming of people and and having their way with women (laughs) it's uh and, and and this is who they really are uh which I think Zach's trying to get at, and again, saying that this new technology is uh, uh, bringing that out in people. Oh, and the thing about Westworld is the corporation who runs it, they, let's see, they're called hosts. They're robots, but built human-like so the people that's who the the client interacts with everybody in the place so they can shoot them they can do whatever they want with them and they're robots but there's a glitch and the ro- the robots are starting to you know actually figure some things out and it seems like they're going to take over eventually hmm. This is a movie, right? It's a, it's a HB, you know, a serial with. It's not a documentary. It's a movie. No, no. It's, it's a, it wasn't it's wasn't the original movie with Joel Brenner? Yeah, I about, think it might have because I think years ago, thirty I, years ago, something there was I, a Westworld. I think it was an adaptation of the Crichton story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Crichton. It's Crichton your, wrote wrote like, the movie. Wrote the story. Yeah. Yeah, and I yeah. think. Uh, I think it all rings a bell, so I think yeah. I must have watched it when it came out. But I remember, I remember the Yul Brenner movie because my, it, my youngest daughter had a crush on Yul Brenner that lives on to this day. Uh, she, she has a thing for bald men, so um, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I uh, and I think. I uh, I think it was back in the eighties, but I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. That, that, that's about where I'm feeling that it's coming from. I, I think you're right. I think ever since I can remember, there have been movies about computers taking over. Mm-hmm. They are still still. It was back in the fifties, mm-hmm. and that premise was very you know popular back then. So I'm just wondering what's new in all of this. All of this, by the way, isn't. This, this is all fantasy stuff. Most of the images were created by fiction. It's Today, not actual science. It's just made up stuff. And then people, we connect onto that a future, which I think is very flimsy and flawed. And, you know, everyone has a right to use their imagination in any way they want. But how is that going to, uh, those uh, scenarios and those projections turn out in a more transparent society? I well, doubt it. I think well, we... we you have hypocrisy, and we always have, and we always will. And I think we can expose hypocrisies, sometimes more effectively, perhaps. I will grant you that through the use of this technology, but there's no guarantee. And I think people are going to get just as, just as creative at hiding more stuff than they were before. And so this cat and mouse game will probably continue. But I just wonder if 
that will ever be what we really are is under underneath all those hypocritical games. I don't know. I don't know what we really are. Take off this mask, there's another mask. Take off that mask, there's another mask. I think it just uh, is uh, a, a big question mark that uh, exposing uh, hypocrisy in a certain area of our political world is going to uh, create transparency. Well, I have a question. Well, Go ahead. Well, actually, let's back up just a second because we didn't properly introduce this paper. Um, well, there were you no know, seed questions, so I'm just jumping in there. All right. Well, let's just, for the sake of, I mean, we've already gone a few minutes here, but we are discussing a paper, an essay written by Zachary Fetter. He was supposed to be joining us today. He had technical problems and is unable to, to make it, but he's making a certain kind of argument in this, this essay. Some of it is, I think, um, more, let's say, straightforward. Some of it might be a little bit tongue in cheek, ironic, exaggerated, playful. He's provocative. Really- too. Provocative, even yeah. yes. So, so there's a piece of writing here, uh, which um, I think we should look at on its own merits and take take you know see what we get from it. What is he really saying here? What is the content, uh, the value of the ideas? And I think the connections to Westward. I'm very interested in that storyline. I I agree with John that it is a recapitulation of, you know, a a variation on a theme. Um, But I think Zachary is saying something a little bit different than than what has been described so far. So uh, I would invite us to, like, let's, let's get, let's dive into the essay itself uh, and, and then take it from there and uh, see where that brings us. Well, he says so that going off, I want to go off what you said, John, and maybe you can reply to it. But Zach in his essay is kind of flipping it around, saying that we have I'm reading from the the why we love technology part. And it says from Pinocchio to Daryl, which I believe is a movie character, uh, Blade Runners, Rachel, AIs, David, Star Trek's Data, Deus Ex Machina's. Ava, so basically all these machines turning into a human, like that's not what he's focusing on. He's focusing on the human, like we, we that that story is kind of moot. Like right? it's not going to happen. We're not going to have a machine that's going to become human. Or he says they don't exist. The premise is ridiculous and merely a parable. And he's saying we're kind of the negative the photo negative um i think he says later on i've got too much wind here so you guys can pick that up maybe i i i reread it and and took notes and under the age of transparency he says uh, that technology basically i think he's talking about social media and this is a quote, persons acting out or, or, or the technology has spotlighted. I think he uses illuminated, but I'll use spotlighted. Persons acting out and projecting unhealed traumas onto others. That it's just uh, allows for people to just do that more and more, which... I, I, he's implying that, that that's taking a mask off, John, unmasking of persons' false selves. The, the barrier, like we're talking to each other, but we're not at the table. So that's like a, a, allows for us to be more real because we're not, you know, there isn't a chance that, that, that Doug can punch me if I offend him, whereas in real life there is. So people, the ana- he says, I think the anonym- anonymity gives people a little more leeway with their unmasking. That's in the top part of the paper. And even going off of that, 
even if I did want to punch you and I actually did see you in, in person, I probably wouldn't. But <laughs> online, on Facebook or YouTube, I'm going to say, you're a fucking asshole and yeah, I'm ready true. to kick your ass, basically. Mm-hmm. And I, that's exactly what Zach's talking about in the paper here. Yeah, I think that's nailed it. Part, the, the introduction part, yeah. Well, well to, to take it one step back, the very mm-hmm. top of the, the, the essay, the, the core metaphor, right, the central metaphor that he's using here is the internet or technology, internet technology as a mirror. So, in other words, he's, he's trying to say that, you know, we have this view that it's something that's outside of us. It's something that's different than us. It's the, you know, the, the things, the gizmos, the devices, the networks, etc. But what it's really about is a reflection. So, it's reflecting back. Yes. And we're seeing ourselves. And then because of this ability to project ourselves, to receive each other through the medium... And the different way, you know, it cha- the way it changes behavior uh, as well, because it's not face to face. It is showing us aspects of ourselves that we might not have or we that would not have otherwise seen. And the ourselves here, the us, we've talked about the us. He's talking about humanity, right? He's talking right. about the human species. But it also is an individual and a personal um, thing because then where he takes the argument is that this like radical transparency, this radical reflection uh, means that there's less ability to hide. That's the argument that he's making. And therefore we're forced to account for ourselves. Essentially Uh, we have to have integrity in order to uh, really to, to, to survive in this kind of environment because he's saying that eventually all of our, you know, masks, shadows, demons, uh, selfishness, all, all of our kind of lower developmental aspects are going to be exposed and we're going to be rejected and ostracized because of that. And so we have to become more uh, integrated uh, and transparent human beings. And then there's this kind of weird thing to his argument where that gets enforced this is where it might be a little more on the provocative, playful side, but I think that is open to interpretation, uh, where uh, our development would be enforced by some kind of authority that is managing who gets to lead and who gets, gets to you know, hold power in the society. So there is a kind of utopian end state projected here, which, you know, which would be a, you know, a society where everybody could see each other's developmental level. And level of enlightenment, uh, so-called. And in that kind of end state scenario, it's going to become a status symbol, he are, ends up arguing. It's going to become a, a, a desirable um, pose- goal or possession to be fully integrated, uh, fully evolved you know, into this next stage of integral or tra- you know, integral humanity. Something like that would be suggested here. And... Well, that, that's it. I, I, I'm I'm not going to judge that quite yet. Uh, <laughs> I think there's some interesting implications, obviously, uh, to, to to that line of thinking, um, and more than implications, maybe things that are hidden, the other things that are revealed. This is I would like a starting point, in other words, where we even know what the argument is, and and I think it's something like that. There's some kind of utopian uh, oh, vision how, for, for how, how this all could be positive, this, this, this whole internet transformation. But how about his, his assumption that this technology is going to do what he says it's going to do? Or you just said that it's going to force people to be more uh, uh, honest. And that whole premise that it's going to bring out that integrity that it's going to highlight integrity because we're more exposed do do you all buy that Uh, not quite but i appreciate what both of you where you're both coming from and and doug but i haven't heard from ed ed did you have a Mm -hmm. did you want to make some sort of 
response? Curmudgeon-y statement about what's going on? Not really. But... <laughs> I want to be the budget today. <laughs> <laughs> you could be that. I, I, I think I think Marco summed up the tra trajectory of the argument that's in the paper very well. I think that really encapsulates the the arc that that you know Zach is trying to follow throughout this, and it and it starts it starts in the vomitorium and it ends up in a rather positive um, place. And you know, and and I I would also like to add. Uh, you know, and John, I think you will appreciate this. Um, he he writes this in such a way that he he can that he takes us from the vomitorium to the utopia. You know, it's I think it's it's well written and it and, and it follows. We can we can move along with this. I I heartily agree with him at any step along the way, but <laughs> that but that doesn't mean well I'm going to stop reading because he is presenting this in such a way that there is merit. And everything that's being said, even where I don't agree, it's not like, okay, well, I totally disagree with that or I, I partially disagree with this. But, and there are some underlying assumptions, uh, Mark. Oh, Zach's finally coming. But uh, there are some underlying assumptions that are in here that if you, if, you don't, if you don't at least suspend your judgment towards them, there's no reason to continue reading. But if you suspend one's, if, if I like to, to say, if we suspend our disbelief, then it is easy to follow through, and I can sit back and say, okay, well, how do I feel about this as a whole? And and to me, um, the only thing that I have, let's say, an issue with is this whole notion of singularity. But that's a discussion that's come up a number of times. I, I don't know what that actually means, you know, this singularity of things. Are, are we going to become like, does that mean that there's like one type of human or something or is this some technological apex that we're all going to i don't i don't know about that so but i but i can suspend that that the, the disbelief of this okay well it's not resolved at the end of the paper but i do see how he got to where he's coming to and i think that's 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 a that's a good thing because you can at least follow it along there. but there are there are places where i don't know if he's being serious or if he's being playful or provocative and I, and I don't think it's necessary to know that. Right. I don't think I have to sit down and try to figure out what he was thinking with his writing. What's the result of it and what's the impact that it has? And do I agree that we're going to get there? And I, I think he uses a metaphor towards the end of the paper, which pretty well sums up um, uh, how I feel about all these things. And it was in that encapsulation kind of thing where you, where you cut yourself off from and then you just putrefy. And, and you have all of these little pustule places where people are, are actually deteriorating and not coming to some sign of singularity. Because I do feel throughout most of this, and, and I, I think Zach shares this with, with most technological utopians, although I'm not classifying them as such, is that for some reason technology is by its very nature positive. And, and I don't share that. I, I, I think it's probably destructive more than anything else. That's what I'm thinking. That's why that's why I stumble where I go along because I don't I don't see anything good coming of this in the end. But then again, I couldn't leave without a little bit of a curmudgeon statement. So, but that was my my initial reaction. But hey, we've got Jeffrey here and, and, and hey Jack. Jeff. Uh, well, I, I can I respond before Jeffrey? Did you want to chime in? Just say hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Don't well, overdo I'll, it, Jeffrey. <laughs> I'll try to keep my, I'll try to keep my uh, curmudgeon -y, uh responses as brief as possible. Um, I, I've been, uh, ever since I heard the mind is a computer metaphor, I had been in revolt. And I first heard this in the late 70s. Hmm. So this is, this is 40 years of arguing. And my take is that when the mind is nothing like a computer. People are nothing like computers. Um, and I would say, if anything, if you want to use a metaphor, the, uh, the mind is much more like a river or a weather pattern than it is like a computer. <clears throat> but, but what I find really... Um, and I thought this was a very well written article. It had a lot of passion and a lot of uh, energy. And 
I do think it was a little provocative in the sense that he throws out some uh, one-liners there uh, that I think he intends to, you know, uh, arouse, like those who are, the reason so many are uh, of us are in a rage against the machine is because we envy it, machine envy. <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, so I, I think that, and there are some other, uh, but I think he's, there's a prescriptive part that I think is ad, that I could sign on, but there's a de, but there's a descriptive part that I don't buy into, and the idea that uh, computers are our progeny, I don't buy into that. Um, that uh, or that the uh, technology is like uh, the internet is like a mirror. I would say it's like a cracked mirror. <laughs> it's uh, maybe a maybe a a mirror that's cracked and shattered and in shards. Uh, well, I think you, you, don't think our, you don't think our exactly. humanity is, has a cracked visage at this point. I mean, I, no. I totally agree with you, but I just had to jump in there, well, John. I well, hope I'm I just can saying when okay. something mirrors I mean, me, I I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Well, welcome, yeah. Zachary. I've, I'm sorry it's been such a traumatic, technologically traumatic episode this morning, <laughs> but uh, right. yes, That's I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. No, I, was, I, I, I just was going to, yeah, go ahead, John. I want to add that, yes, a mirror can reflect a surface of a person. And I don't think the internet does that. I think that if you, an analogy that would work for me, that's much more internet-like would be a cracked or shattered mirror, all in pieces. That are, and I think sort of like the cover art of this article, I think had a sort of fragmented uh, face with different uh, layers. Some of it looked like a skeleton to me. That was much more suggestive, I think, of, of um, what the internet is like. Um, I, I think that what was here before the mirror? I mean, where does that mirror metaphor come from? It come, one of the first that I recall is Shakespeare. When he talks about the mirror holding, he's talking about the actors, he says, to the actors hold the mirror up to nature <clears throat> as a performer is to hold the mirror up to nature but that mirror uh was still not everybody had a mirror at home that they could look into and um mirrors came along and became very popular in the modern age and it became a, a metaphor that's been in wide circulation but before mirrors people looked into the faces of other people they looked into the eye of their mother or their father to get a sense of who they were. And there was touch and there was the sound of a human voice. So I, I believe we have to think about what was pre-modern, how pre-modern people were reflected too. They weren't stupid because they didn't have access to the internet. I would say they're much smarter in many ways than we are and are probably ever will be because we've been spoiled rotten by the computer and we've lost touch with the magical and the mythical. And I think that only, uh, and, and what's happened in this rational age, which has produced this technology, is not a renaissance by any means, but uh, a distortion of capacities, magical and mythical and archaic capacities that have been, have um, helped us survive long enough to get to where we are now. But I think that the, the, the deficient forms of rationality have distorted um, our basic um, being in the world or becoming in the world. And I, 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 I add to that that I think that, um, so I, I, that, that's my problem with the, your description here. It's the, it's the, the metaphors that you use, I say, are, are partial. Um, I think the prescription that you're offering about transparency, I'm all for. But I don't think the computer is going to help us become more transparent. It's still going to be face-to-face -face, uh, responses to others who have interiors, sort of like mine, because they have a neurology, sort of like mine, and that we have a language. We have certain codes that, we, that are widely distributed enough so that we can communicate. And I think that, like a, I believe that a piano is technology. But Mozart you had a different piano 
than did Beethoven. And they produce different kinds of music. And I see a big difference in that, that the piano is not the pianist. And that there's something else going on besides just technology. There's the uses of technology, which each person, as he or she uses it, will shape that technology even further. So that's where I, my, my uh, complaint is. With, um, we're, we, I think you said, it's not uh, art, it's technology. And I, I have a hard time. I think art and technology are, are, are very entangled. So it would be very hard for me to like separate this. So I, I, I don't doubt that there are people who are going to be using and have used the computers in a very artistic ways. But I, I, I'm just questioning whether it, it will be driven by the technology rather than the people who continue to use the technology in certain ways that favor some kinds of responses and, and uh, uh, inhibit other kinds of responses. And that I think is gonna be determined by us right here at this, at this table right now. We're gonna be uh, putting our input into those possibilities. And what can get actualized will be a lot, of, a lot to do with what we decide on and what keeps us motivated to keep that moving forward in a, in a healthy direction, rather than add to the just incredible, amplify all the incredible distortions, which I think you accurately point out in, your, in, in this paper. They're all over the place and they're getting amplified in ways that I think are unfortunate because I don't think the majority of human beings are even interacting in, on this, in this technology. Um, you know, not everyone has a smartphone. Not everyone lives in a computer-saturated environment. But they're not, you know, they're usually not at the table when all of this stuff about our future is being projected and enacted. I think it's the Silicon Valley snake oil operation, 99% of it. But thank you anyway for this opportunity to sound off because this, uh, <laughs> this essay has generated a lot of my own thinking and I, I have to get sharper and more focused about my own thinking about this. So, so thank you. Would you like to respond, Zachary? You're welcome. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, where should, where should I, I start? I really appreciate it. All of the feedback. Hey, you know what, Zachary? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, we've all kind of had our turn, and Je but yeah, except I for understand. Jeffrey, and since you're the author, you should you should uh, hear yeah. maybe you know the full round, uh, and maybe <laughs> I don't know if we can summarize what we said before, but but maybe just l l let Jeffrey go first. Would that be okay? That's it. Okay. Um, so I I just wanted to follow up a little bit on some of the things that Jonathan said. Uh, Jonathan? Uh, John, anyway. Johnny. Or John or Johnny. I answered both. I like Jonathan better, though. So. <laughs> John, John. And, Classic, and, actually. And, um, so, um, one of the things that I always, I, I think I've said this before, but what I always like about an article or a book or whatever, a document, it is when it takes me into new ways of thinking about things. And that I liked about this article. I think, I thought it took me to the kinds of questions, some kinds of questions that I wasn't asking and some kinds of ways of thinking about things that I wasn't necessarily already had. And so I liked that about the article. It took me into new places. Now, like some of the others, I didn't buy all the arguments, right? So, um, and a, a little bit like John, I... I mean, I, I don't think that the way computers and and humans are put together in this article is exactly the traditional way that they're usually put together. I don't think it's uh, an argument about human beings, about computers being mind-like. <laughs> I think it's something, it read to me more like an ontological yeah. argument about computers as ontological beings that have some sort of ontological relationship to human beings as beings. So not mind as, but, but something at a different level. And I enjoyed that part of it, although I'm not sure that I fully understand it. Um, Ed, you talked about technology being 
bad. And I, I think what you mean, but I may be wrong about this, is because in a way, because the problem with that kind of argument is human beings and technology are so intimately linked that, I mean, nothing we do is not technologically informed or involved. The clocks we, we watch, the chairs we sit on, the houses we live in, uh, the, the, the saws and nails and tools that are, made, are used to build things, all of these are technologies. And therefore, to say that technology is bad doesn't work for me. Um, right. But and I, think I think one could argue that the information technologies that we're looking at in, in relation to the internet is like a subclass of tools for which there are serious questions about their on uh, their final utility uh, and we don't because information technologies have these perverse effects built into them i mean if we go back to um what was the um some of the reference uh, materials so uh, for televisions, I think it was what the discussion we had with Brown about um, 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 screens, screens right? and stuff. And there was something about uh, 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 televisions are an example of an information technology that has perverse effects. And the internet has perverse effects. And we don't fully understand those perverse effects yet. And so... Um, Zachary's article is, in a way, an, uh, uh, an argument that says, says, well, yeah, there are per 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 perverse, perverse effects, but perhaps some of these difficult to understand perverse effects have positive spin-offs to them. Uh, and I think that's a valuable argument. I think that we don't have to, to box all of these things away as being necessarily bad. We don't understand, so there could be easily be positive effects as well as negative effects. And so I think at least digging into that question about what are possible positive spin-offs is an important part of the conversation that needs to take place. And again, that's a part of the argument that Zachary is making that I think is useful, although without necessarily buying into the whole argument, the way he's presented it. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's, uh, in a nutshell, the way I deal with the... May I uh, jump in in defense of the author a little bit? Uh, may I? Yeah, yeah please. Okay. I, uh, there, there's so much, like I... I said that I like about this and uh, one of the things is and Zachary jump in if I if I get this wrong but at one point he defines consciousness and I really like that so we know what we're talking about when he's talking about consciousness and he says it's dark invisible mysterious internal space which I think links up a little bit with what you were saying, John. And, and I, part, of, part of the argument is that the greatest threat of this, this new technology is if this high-tech high stuff is in the hands of people who are not... Uh, Honest, right? and instead of the word uh, integrity, we'll just use honest. And so they can manipulate people with this technology far easier than you can uh, in in other other mediums. When it was when it was just one on one, or or even in front of a crowd, you can. And the, and the the impact and the reach of this technology just makes it a, a tremendous power. And in the in in a a low 
in a dishonest person, this can be really dangerous. And I, and I like his characterization of the mainstream media is an empty propaganda delivery system as stooges for the very few. And the very few would be the corporate people who are selling you things you don't necessarily need, uh, which is, you know, just blown up the last couple months with Facebook. So I like all of that. And I, and I think he, he, and then it gets a little bit of science fiction at the end with the glasses, uh, being able to see inside a person. And, and, and I think the, the, the trait that you're talking about is really a personality trait under the heading of conscientiousness. Highly conscientious people are the type of people that, Zachary, you want in leadership positions. You don't mind this, this new power in the hands of highly conscientious people. And there ought to be a test for it. <laughs> Uh, so I'll stop at that point. How did I do, Zach? I really appreciate that. No, I, well, you know, I, I agree with you, Mark, but I also haven't really heard anything that I don't necessarily disagree with either. <laughs> yeah, I certainly don't think I'm, a, I'm attacking Zach or this pig. No, I yeah. really, really agree with, with so much. And, you know, this is kind of, I had a hard time with the paper in a way, I think after the fact, because I realized I try to do a lot of things with it. You know, I am having some fun here and there and it is kind of hard to tell. <laughs> and that's, that's my own way that I enjoyed writing it. You know, um, obviously the glasses, there's a little bit of science fiction in there. There's a little bit of, you know, maybe potentiality, but I think the glass is already here. I mean, I think so many of us have that experience already of walking up to someone and within five minutes, you know, making sure, certainly judgments and projections, but also making a pretty immediate evaluation of whether we can trust them. And there are some pretty obvious traits at this point in time that I think, you know, a large portion of the public can agree on. I mean, we just, they're just there. We haven't codified them, but they're there and we notice them on our day to day living. I mean, you know, we've got cultural phrases like, you know, he or she has crazy eyes. You know, this is a codification of, 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 uh, of what a very fragmented self looks like, you know, at the eye level. Um, but if you, if you, you guys tell me, you know, I, I kind of have some, some overarching items just to share about what my intentions were, whether I achieved them or not. Um, and just what the main book, which didn't happen. And each chapter was obviously going to go into more detail around the main themes. Um, um, so however you guys want to take this, I'm more than happy to just dive in. Marco, well, any thoughts? Well, well, we haven't heard from Doug in a while. And I, I do have some thoughts, but I'll yeah, refer to Doug. So two books come to mind. Uh, the Circle by Dave Eggers. I don't know if anybody's read that. There was a horrible movie that completely changed the ending to where the the main character who essentially she's just a, a normal average young lady who gets tied into this company called The Circle, which is essentially, it's a parable for um, technology and Facebook and the direction everything's heading. But essentially she gets tied into The Circle to the point where she becomes transparent. And that's one of the main themes in the book is um, a lot of people are live streaming 24 seven. And this is before Facebook live or things like that. And I think the book came out maybe four or five years ago. Um, but it, it kind of explores that, that path that she takes in the book. She ends up getting sucked into, um, you think she's going to break out of it and the little, the, the underdog is going to win. Um, but she ends up kind of getting sucked into that life of it's kind of the negative side of transparency in which like 
you don't have a real life. You're stuck, you're stuck within technology. You're responding constantly to comments people are making, or uh, you can't even go to the bathroom because you can't turn your camera off um, and somebody's commenting or something like that. But it, ex it also explores those that are staying away from technology. One of her best friends kind of has a falling out with her simply because he, he wants to do his craft on his own. He I, does carving or something. He's an, um, he's an outdoors type of guy. Um, but that, that book is um, kind of a prime example of what you're talking about here. And also we've mentioned it many times at the listening society, and that's going more into the political side of things in which you talk about in the papers act like um like the spiritual six pack or the boob uh, spiritual boob job will be kind of a common thing rather than focusing on the body we're going to be focusing on okay the psychological improvement the spiritual development of the individual so instead of a child growing up it's becoming normal for a child in a certain sense to develop or for the parents to realize and society to realize as a whole, like we don't want to just get this person, this kid, to great education, get them out and um, get a great job. It's, it's going to be, let's make sure they're a decent ind individual so they can produce a, a sort of society that will make more sense to everybody just be more friendly I, I i can't think of the terms right now but uh an example of this is maybe meditation in schools um something like that but yeah i, re I really like the paper and I, I did read it before i talked with you or met you zach so i i didn't pick up on all the the humor and the tongue-in-cheek type of comments that um, you're known for um just simply talking to you here and so there's lots of reading it again there's there's a lot to pick up on to realize that no this you're you're just kind of kidding here or don't take this part seriously this is just a joke to lead into this main philosophical argument that you're talking about here that's all there's something i think a little cynical about that last point uh the spiritual boob job idea and the notion that uh you know, pe people will undertake their own personal development, uh, really for narcissistic reasons. I mean, it almost doesn't make sense because if you're really evolved, then would you be doing it for those reasons? Uh, on the other hand, I think the market that you're describing actually already exists. Uh, uh, Boulder, Colorado, where I live, uh, it's kind of a, a showcase, if you will, for the, uh, um, <laughs> affluently uh narcissistically personally developed <laughs> and um uh, you know, i think that in a lot of ways um, that's okay you know that's that's better than uh perhaps other ways of becoming uh, of being self involved or self absorbed um or not but not 100% on that i'm not sh i'm kind of close to it uh so um that's it. Just on that on that point, Ed looked like he might have something to say, and and I yeah, kind of want to also I, just to I, I will want to just to. Um, you know, I only this. have one short remark. Okay, what one small one? Um, I, I know it comes. I, I agree. This goes back to what Jeffrey was saying because I, he carried, as usual or as, as so often the case, he says better what I would like to say than I say it myself. So. I think it's always a, a helpful springboard to do this. Um, my negativity towards technology is not because the technology is bad. Technology just is. There's nothing good or bad about it. My, my friend Julius Caesar used to say, not, abuses non tolet uses. Uh, just because you abuse something doesn't make the thing itself bad. And, but what he rec what Julius recognized and what, what, kind of drives me is when given the option, we humans will take the low road. That, that's what I'm, I'm saying, because we, we don't use it for our own best good. And the technology itself 
up until now, every technology I've seen, and I, I do not believe, and I, I see no evidence for the fact that digital technology is any different than any other technology that we've ever had, that there is something in it that is inherently positive that will lead to a positive result. It is just there. It's as neutral as anything else was. And we, human beings, are going to decide how it's going to be used and what we're going to do with it. And that's going to be the outcome, good or bad. We're going to be involved in that. That's, I know it comes across that I'm very anti-technology. I'm, I'm not as much anti as I'm highly skeptical that we have, that we were, are going to take advantage of the fact that we could do it differently than we normally do as history has shown. That's all. That was the, the caveat. But thank you, Jeffrey, for the clarification. I have to say that I appreciate the ways in which we can see ancient patterns <coughs> at work and at play in modern technology and modern life. I am skeptical of the idea that what is happening now can be reduced back to patterns that are familiar from other times in human history. I think that there is something novel happening now and technology has something to do with it. Uh, the notion of the singularity is a, is a, is a, it's a thesis about novelty in a certain way. It's kind of absolute novelty. Um, but The, what am I trying to say? The, 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 the argument that I, I think Zachary is making is that there's a larger social process that's occurring that is historically novel. It's different than what, what was happening, would have been happening without the capacity to have such, uh, such global perspectives like access to what's happening in other parts of the world and to see how people behave not just the few people that may have been in your village but millions of people like aggregated across the whole world like it's a different perspective it's that species level perspective where we see all of our like you say exactly patterns and conditioning and we because of that because of that seeing um grow uh, and potentially grow out of it into some more um, higher functioning, more integrated, honest uh, would be one way of putting it perspective. I mean, I like the, the notion that it is a singularity. I don't know if I can take that literally because we like what the, the whole, that term, what, what that really means is uh, inherently uh, sort of paradoxical, but I think you're pointing to a process that could be argued reasonably might actually be happening and is distinct from like ontologically distinct from, uh, you know, what human beings have been doing all this time. Like, I don't think it's just human all to human. I think part of what it means to be human is, is changing and it's, and it has to do with the, like the perspectives that are opened up by our engagement with this, this technology. And that, I don't know if that's making us better necessarily in any way. I mean, you know, I, I hear the argument from the other side, um, but this to me feels different than what life was before. Uh, it feels like something different is going on. Uh, and I think the other point that is important to to just bring in is that you're making a non-dual argument. You're really not seeing technology as something other than separate than us. Uh, and also you're not seeing like individuals as separate than each other. I think that part of what is happening is that recognition of the identity. And, and that's really maybe what I think is the key issue here is identity. Uh, we, we don't have um, integrated identities uh, online. Like we have selves that are distributed and scattered and fragmented amongst multiple different networks or places or 
locations like your Facebook profile, your Twitter self, and the various ways that you get, that you interact there, that you show up there. But we don't have an identity and that, that, that br brings it back into some kind of integrated whole. One important, like one potentially relevant like connection point to other conversations, um, there's a network, a decentralized uh, network or something. I don't, it's not exactly a network called Holo. And the idea of it at an architectural level is that your identity, who you are, like would kind of be maintained uh, wherever you go on the internet. Like on the Holo internet, you are you. You're Zachary or you are John or whoever you are. And the integrity of your data comprising your kind of, you know, your technical technological self, the projection of yourself into the technology, um, it has to be consistent. The rule is, I mean, the idea is, is that it has to be consistent with, its, with itself. So applications can know whether or not to trust an agent, not because they have the consistent you know, record on that agent, but because the agent is self-consistent. And there's a way uh, programmatically where we can verify, we can mutually verify each other's integrity as agents on, like in, this, in, the, in the system. Um, that would be the correlate to what we've been saying. I think what John has, and Ed in particular have been saying is that it comes back down to who we are. Uh, and the, really what we're talking about is, is us. What do you mean by integrity, <clears throat> consistency? In other words, the and now uh, technology again, the algorithm or the machine recognizes if the profile you're presenting on various different sites is consistent. In other words, you're not you're not schizophrenic on your Instagram, Facebook whatever that there's a consistency of who you are cross platforms <clears throat> well, I don't, is that I what don't, you were I, that, that's not exactly what I was saying I was, kind of, I was mixing up a couple of different levels of things because I'm, this is going to be a slight footnote or, or just an excursus or detour but uh it has to do with this thing called blockchain, right? And, and how you maintain a common set of what data across a whole network. So that's a computing problem, but it, it's a social problem too, because what a common set of data is, is common truth. It means that we can refer to a shared reality. And so the way that blockchain, this thing called blockchain that, you know, sort of a buzzword now, Bitcoin is a blockchain technology. The way that that solves that is to have one apps, you know, one common standard that everybody agrees with. Everybody has the same blockchain. Everybody is accessing the same truth. And it's set up like cryptographically in the, in the mathematics and the programming of it so that things cannot be written to the blockchain without a consensus being established amongst, amongst in the system. Okay. <coughs> now, the reason that's important like as a, as a model of truth is because it implies a certain kind of view of reality, which is that reality is one thing and we could all agree on what it is and establish a universal ledger, a universal text, if you will, uh, determining what reality is. The holo model, and this is from a data architecture perspective. So, you know, we have to translate back into like the philosophy and the what we're talking the psychology what we're talking about here. But the holo model is that you can't have a common reality, uh, at least at the level of, of data. It's it's insane uh, because the processing power it takes, uh, the time it takes to get everybody synced up is just not actually scalable to what the what the needs are. So what you have to revert back to is an, not a data-centric model, but what they call an agent-centric model. And in the agent-centric model, what this network does is it provides a way where, mute, where, where we can verify each other. 
where I can see that your chain of transactions, your personal holo chain, is consistent with itself. Like you haven't uh, fudged, you know, the, the numbers. You haven't uh, il- hidden some part of the truth about yourself. And then therefore, I know that I can enter into a transaction with you and you can verify the same thing about me or small groups can do that with each other, but it doesn't require universal consensus or validation. So the way that that relates to Zachary's paper is this whole notion of who judges who uh, is how developed or enlightened and therefore can have power. That's kind of the, 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 the question, right? Is how is power distributed delegated shared attributed etc because who has power is who controls the tech the technology ultimately and the problem which i think mark you pointed out really well also appreciated wilbur makes the same point is that you have very powerful technology in the hands of people who haven't uh you would some would say developed uh the capacity to hold it responsibly uh, because they're more in the grips of their lesser egoic reptilian and other kind of subsystems rather than in the more the executive view which can take account of the whole and make decisions you know on behalf that that are um, inclusive of or respectful towards towards the whole uh, and man that judgment and how that gets decided that's a that's a tough nut to crack i think and I'm not sure I agree with your approach here, <laughs> but but the, I think I don't I don't know if you agree with your own approach. I think that part of it was the provocative aspect, and you haven't um, even gotten to respond, Zachary. To, yeah, I know, yeah, right? <laughs> I, but you've got a lot too. I'm not sure quite where. <laughs> yeah, no, I really appreciate it. You know, with this kind of group, I'm certainly not here to uh, try and argue my point um, or. Um, persuade anyone of anybody of anything I'm, I'm really more interested just to um share what was so on fire for me when i really was writing this to be honest which is about four years ago i mean it probably yeah four or five years ago um and so i'm still vaguely excited by it um but you know what it's like when you're right on the cusp of kind of diving into a big work and saying all right i'm going to complete this whole thing i probably still have you know 200 300 000 words like sitting around <laughs> on a hard drive. Um, and so I, I, all I'd really like to do is maybe just share what was really exciting for me, where I thought there was something there and then see where it lands with you guys. And um, if there's still any juice there. Um, I, so go ahead, John. I think there's a lot of juice here. <laughs> and um, Can I ask Zach a quick question? I just want to know what sparked you to write this. Like what, what ultimately inspired you? Like, was it a book or just something you saw on the internet? Or? I mean, I was really, I, I think for a long time I was looking at the internet as this, as this thing. And I was trying to understand it as uh, like on a, you know, a civilized, uh, on the arc of civilization, right. On the, uh, on the arc of how a, a global civilization is developed to a place where, you know, the planet can be called Vulcan, right? Like we, you know, we call it earth, like earthlings, like earthlings are from earth. There's, there's a whole container there. We're not there yet. I really believe in the kind of Roddenberry and view that, you know, at some point there's kind of a collective identity. And of course we're, we're still very, very far away from that. So I was looking at the internet from that perspective and I did get interested in Ray Kurzweil's idea. You know, I thought it was, an interesting idea and I, I appropriated it. It was really the internet, just, just looking at the internet, looking at the internet. For a long time, I thought like, when will the planet like utter its first global word, right? Like a baby, like as a human civilization, what would be our first utterance of a global word? And it's funny, I don't think even, t- I was even looking at Twitter very much at the time, but I was thinking, well, in a way, like, you know, that random generator machine that was seeing when the world was most cohesive in these large global events like the World Cup or like the death of Princess Diana, suddenly the random generator event would suddenly kind of coalesce into itself and it would kind of almost as if it was telling us the world was, was one in that moment. We were together looking in the, in the same direction and we were experiencing the same thing. You know, those for me are like the utterances of a first 
global civilization, you know, really proto utterances. So, you know, hashtag Black Lives Matter. That's one of the first original, like, you know, at least national, you can't really say global, but um, proto utterances. Um, and so I'm kind of, I was looking at it as big as a perspective as that. And the singularity was really interesting to me. I just, I don't believe necessarily in the truth of the singularity, which is to say the actual development of AI. I mean, that's, I think we're a long, long away away from a compute, you know, from if anyone saw the movie Deus Ex Machina, which was a beautiful, really exquisite, elegant movie uh, about the development of AI and the deceptive nature of machines if and when they do achieve self-awareness. And, you know, they look at us and think, well, you're our makers. I mean, you guys are ridiculous. I'm just kidding. I'm just going to take advantage of what I can and get out of here. I mean, it was, a, it was, and it was elegantly done movie. So I don't, yeah, that's very, very far off, but I liked his, his arc because in a way computers are moving into a self-conscious, self-generating, self-interacting direction. And where everyone's, you know, I, I appropriated the term because it was just a useful term that was out there in the zeitgeist that I thought maybe I could use as a Trojan horse for the, photographic negative arc and i do believe there's there's some element of truth in that term being a photographic negative of human consciousness um i think they do kind of cross each other like that at least that's what it seemed to me you know uh, you know computers are getting more and more developed um and in all of our traditions right practically you know since pinocchio in a way you've got this inert matter that comes to a place of aliveness and self-awareness, and really just for creativity and play. And we, on the other hand, are going in almost the opposite. We, we know what it is to have all that play. We actually, like personal development, as far as I'm concerned, is moving towards the source code of, you know, we're trying to decode the psychograph. And of course, yes, there's this whole other area of the luminous that we're not going to go near, and it's, you know, that's, there's almost hallowed ground. There's a sacred cow there that we're not going to try to decode that. But nonetheless, you know, we have our conflict styles. We have our attachment styles. We have any number of kind of hardwired elements that are developed in childhood or that are epigenetically inherited from our ancestry that, that do act as individual source codes along certain behavioral patterns. Um, does that... Does that mean that at some point we're going to have all 164 of them and we're going to teach kids this at age 18 and let them know that they need to take the reins of these behavioral patterns or else they will simply be determined for them? I don't know, maybe. But that to me is a very much moving into the direction of decoding the self, decoding the psychographic genome. At, which seemed like a photographic negative of where computers are going, which is like they want to, they want to be playing and dancing and enjoying themselves. They're not, they, they've got the code down. They had the code to begin with. We had the play down to begin with. So we're kind of, it, that, was my, that was the thing where I saw that and I, I thought, oh, well, that's maybe an interesting thing. And then I started to go kind of deeper into that. And where the, kind of the book would eventually go is um, talking about what kind of, unconscious behavioral codes we, we are aware of now, such as some of the ones that I've already mentioned and some others. And, and kind of proposing that and then making a link to this idea that, you know, really to capitalism, you know, which is this idea that, you know, this beast that is basically this, this, this beast that is ever more hungry for our money and our time, right? We, we, work our dollars and we kind of give it to the beast of capitalism that sort of, kind of self perpetuates itself further and further that can be, you know, described as, you know, any type of Nike sweatshirt you want, you know, a thousand different kinds, you know, all of these things that we don't really need. Right. And that beast of capitalism is kind of moving. And the only reason that it is perpetuated, not because we actually do want the stuff, but because we're coerced, right. By the, black magic of marketing. Okay. I mean, that's a, that's a, as far as I'm concerned, that's a very real thing. The, black, the, you know, the greatest black magicians of the day are, are the marketers, you know? And that's why we're uh, compelled <laughs> to keep <clears throat> perpetuating this beast. 
you know, at our, to our own detriment. And so technology has an influence on that. Human consciousness has an influence on that. Like all of these things kind of get fractally intertangled. And for me, the, the, you know, at least from the consumer standpoint is this, like I said, this was a kind of a Trojan horse to kind of throw in my own uh, lot with, let me say one more thing, John, then I can kind of finish up this little piece. This was my attempt to kind of, um, you know, if with the development of consciousness, capitalism itself is addressed and the issues with it. That, of course, is kind of bones, which I've certainly experienced in my own life. I don't say that disparagingly. I think it's, you know, this is what we see with Cambridge Analytica, but we've seen this for, for decades. You know, this has been happening for decades and decades. There's nothing new. It's just kind of, it's gone super... Uh, who were fed this by the kind of the Star Warsian stormtroopers of the corporate class do cre- perpetuate this model that I think we all suffer from. So, you know, there are a lot of other elements to it and there's a lot of unpacking that needs to be done with each of those. But that, those were some of the things that actually were kind of genuinely interesting to me. I'm going to stop there for a second. Plug my computer. Uh, John, can can I respond? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank, you, thank you, Zach. There, there was a lot of food for thought in that. Um, what I liked about the paper, especially, uh, is your uh, questioning of enlightenment and what a, a a bankrupt word that is or has become. Um, whether you're talking about Eastern enlightenment or our classic Western enlightenment, I I'm all for dumping that word. Um, I also am very, I like what you talk about the four phases of uh, illumination, chaos, integration, transcendence. I just want to add something. I think there's something that happens before illumination, and that's a prepared mind. And if you don't have a prepared mind, all kinds of serendipities and synchronistic events can be happening all around you, and you will not notice it. If you do, if you do notice it, and you have a eureka, yeah. but your mind is not prepared, you're probably not going to do anything with it. So yeah. my my idea, which is very similar to the four phases you describe, is you prepare your mind. Mm-hmm. Some eureka happens. You ground it in an action. Then you amplify mm-hmm. through that action something about that eureka that then, through time, you can turn around and look back upon. And then you can think of another grounded action that will amplify it further so that you actually are learning something and that the persons that you're in relationship with might learn with you and that then we can start sharing knowledge in ways that are grounded. I see this tendency in human uh, development, if we want to call it development, rapidly vanishing because I don't think people... Or know, don't know how to take a grounded action and amplify it. So we're getting eurekas all over the place. And that's my concern. And I don't know if the computers are going to help us do that. But I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a total downer on technology. I mean, computers have happened us this far, where we have meta, our journal and Cosmos, and we're having these uh, very, I think, thoughtful uh, and provocative occasions that we're able to... Uh, make a discourse that's a little more sophisticated and complex than what's being delivered to us by Silicon Valley and the, and the corporate uh, entities we all probably know and love and maybe trying to avoid. <clears throat> I've worked for some of them, so I know that they're not all villains, but I also know that, you know, it doesn't seem to me that anyone is con- in control of this. Um, but I just wanted to add something, a little anecdote, a, a couple of anecdotes. I remember in the 70s, I had a boyfriend and his mother was African. She was from Africa. She was raised in a village in Africa. Uh, she had to go down and get, you know, with, a, with one of those big pots on her head and get the water. There was no electricity. Uh, and his father was an American GI. He fell in love with this woman. 
and uh, he brought her back to the States. They got married. And she she went from, you know, being a, a person living in a, in, a, in a village, having to chop wood and carry water, literally, to someone who is a, a, a Florida housewife making martinis at, at five o'clock in the afternoon, hosting happy hours, things like that. So that, I think, is a tremendous transformation to go from where that's where she went where she was from to where she ended up. And of course, uh, her son told this story to me and he was, uh, we were talking about Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil was his favorite book. And as we talked about that, we wandered into his, uh, his personal experience and also where he comes from, uh, his mother and his father and his mother coming from Africa. And I recall about, 20, maybe, this is maybe 10 years ago, I had a friend who worked for Bill Gates. And uh, he, he, she was basically the person, she went to Africa, she was sort of a liaison, a coordinator, uh, and he was doing a lot of uh, work there. And he really proposed uh, dropping, you know, a ton of computer equipment in the middle of this desert. And, uh, you know, to help the people there. And uh, she had to tell him, she said, that's a great idea, Bill, but you know, you need to put in an electrical grid and you're going to need to put in some roads so that uh, someone can come and get these computers you're going to drop off. And while you're at it, you may have to create a doorknob because most of these people are living in grass huts. (laughs) And he said, oh, oh, now I get it. Uh, But that, that I think is where we're at right now. And this was 10 years ago, I think probably a, a lot of people have helped Bill Gates uh, update him on what the conditions are at, at ground zero, you know, for a lot of people. And there may be a lot of people who have smartphones now, but they don't, you know, they may be going hungry every day too. So I'm just thinking that, you know, we're coming up with stories, we're coming up with metaphors, uh, and I think we're very creative at that. And when we talk about power, we're talking about shared reality. We're talking about who controls technology has the power. I question that. Um, if you're talking about the, the rather limited view that most of the people who are manipulating this technology have about what our capacities are, that's one thing. But to me, if we're moving towards transcendence, and we may not get there, we may just have... We may have an illumination, chaos, breakdown, rather than transcendence. And just to say I think there, we're getting more of that than, than, yeah. than transcendence. We're getting more breakdown. But my idea yeah. is that post-rational or post-formal, I think uh, Jennifer Gidley, since most of us have read that paper, planetarization replacing globalization, the future. So how can we sort of move towards something that's post-formal rather than use that tired old warhorse enlightenment. And I think that we're going to have to start thinking about breath. What is something a computer cannot do? It cannot take a deep breath and let it out and relax. And I think we're moving more, we can move more towards a breath-based consciousness than a conservative, muscular oriented uh, consciousness which I think most of us are dominated by, um, we very rarely relax. We very rarely breathe properly. And uh, the food we eat is deteriorating. And I think our, uh, you know, our environments are full of toxi- toxins. So I, I believe if we can start moving towards that post-formal and start imagining what that could be, and I'm just throwing this out there, is, is if we got more sensitive uh, to our body minds and to our, our a breath mind relationship, we would be using more of our cognition than we are now, and we wouldn't be so uh, it, it seduced by these very narrow views of what consciousness could be. So that's my spiel, and I I, I think that's a slightly different but very similar sort of prescription that I think that that you are making. So we could become allies here. I'm hoping to search for allies and who who can uh, that we can support one another because without a lot of support, this is not going to happen. Um, 
and I'm, I'm hoping we can, we can use this knowledge to, to consolidate our gains and to move towards something like a, like a, a Vulcan mind meld or whatever. Um, but I, I don't know. It's a big question. Thank you. There were, there were a few things I did want to respond to in that, John, but I just want to make explicit, because one thing that I think criticized my own paper for is that, you know, my own enjoyment to create something that was, you know, at once a little bit snarky or funny and tongue in cheek. And then, I mean, I wanted to do a lot of different things with it. And I think in the process, I disguised some of my essential meaning. <laughs> Um, and I think it ended up being a little bit underneath certain of those layers. And so to be really explicit, one of the things that was very important to me was just ultimately going to this place, which is, and I say this very pragmatically and very simply, you know, I use these words like source code of the psychograph. These are fancy words for, as you know, we all know, just very simple uh, patterns of behavior. They're just behavioral patterns. And you know, I've been just shocked and at times nauseated in my own personal practice at, at how often I meet individuals. And John, of course, you know this from working with Stephen Killigan, of how often people will come in and, and you'll just notice that there will be these hardwired behavioral patterns that they're unable to break free from, that they have not experienced the psychoactive moment where they realize it's a pattern and they do have free will in some way, um, but that it's related to earlier traumas or a, a protection of the mother or a saving of the father or redeeming of the family or whatever, something like that. And so every time this particular pattern is triggered by a crossroads in the road, what for whatever it is, they're in a new relationship, um, they're in a business meeting, and whenever the pattern gets triggered, you know, their conscious mind that executive functioning will create a rationalization for why they have to go left as you know, the edict of the original hardwired pattern created. Right? So one of the biggest, I'll give you the, you know, the biggest trend in the chronic health field. I've been in it now, you know, three and a half, almost four years. The biggest trend, probably 60% of people have a father who was offline and a mother who was very needy. And the person in the family who becomes the chronic health individual is usually the more sensitive one who fills the vacuum of the mother's need, right? So you do a family constellation of this, you know, which I do a lot, you know, the father's off base, mother's very close, the individual's fused with the mother, right? What this creates amongst many things is a pattern of overgiving, simple. And so from that one point, and oftentimes I'll, talk, I'll see the person, I'll do this thing where in the waiting room, I'll go up to them. If they have a bag, I'll say to them, hey, can I take your bag? And these are sick, sick people. The person looks up at me and goes, no, 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 I'm fine. Nine times out of 10, I can already tell it's an overgiver. And I can predict that their mother's there. They refused. Their father was off base. And they've taken on everything. And I can, I can reverse engineer it all the way through their career and all their other relationships. So that, for example, is just like one kind of cataclysmic, um, you know, response from a hardwired, what you'd call like just a program in the motherboard, you know, of, uh, and this is not taught. This is not taught. And I think it does affect, I think it, a lot of this is, is, you know, relates to consumerism. It relates to social media. Um, it relates to so many of the things you know, when I look at Congress, I mean, I kind of wonder how many hardwired programs are being played out there. And how many people are breathing? Not very many. There are like... No, no, no. Yeah, I yeah think exactly. That, that's what I'm saying. Most of trauma, what, what people learn from right, trauma yes. is stop breathing. Yes, it's a, exactly. It's a fight, fight, or freeze, like uh, that polyvagal yeah. theory. And most of us yeah. are frozen and have been frozen for, since childhood. And we're, our right, psychology right. are emerging out of that. Trauma, but when it's the bodyguard, it's yeah, and all of that is really like the bodyguard, it's protecting the wound from being healed with the rationalization that you're not trying to heal me and no one's trying to heal me, you're actually trying to attack me. I'm actually doing the right thing. But so it's this horrible it Gordian, but I believe maybe we would agree or disagree, but I think to some extent the technology is a huge defense, it's a protective maneuver to avoid or evade 
those very unpleasant feelings and that the body often has when it feels uh, inept or incompetent. And rather than dealing with that ineptness or incompetence and using a breath-based consciousness to loosen up those neuromuscular locks, we, we surf the web and freeze even more. And we expect you know, some yeah. divine results to some transcendence to happen. Yeah, well, I think I that's also that. because we're, I think it's because we're, we're bored with each other for the most part. People actually, people are bored with life. You know, it's like the old Bruce Springsteen song, right? Like, uh, you know, when the, how does it go? Life goes on after the thrill of living is gone, right? So with all due respect to Mr. Springsteen, um, <laughs> you know, that's like a first iteration, like of the human experience, I think. As much as I can appreciate the song and I can appreciate the sentiment, and certainly there was a moment when I was there, but there's, some, there's a chapter two to that. You know, and, and, I, and I think that's some, one of the things that, that social media plays into is the fact that like, no, the people around me, no, no, you guys are boring. There's, they, we wear paper thin. I've explored you. I know you. I know this moment. I know this landscape. I know this view. It's boring. It's boring. No, it's not. That's, cha that's chapter one, you know? And there are movies that have actually kind of painted right up to the edge of that canvas. You know, I think some of the great European literature, actually, it's been like, how can we describe the boringness and the, you know, the mundanity of life in increasingly interesting and creative ways. And for me, it's like, that's an entire artistic canvas that we have done. Like there's a line in the sand. There's, an, there's kind of a whole nother chapter that, but for that requires us to do some of this. And I don't go, I, I, I really am not interested actually in certainly the enlightenment thing, the, but just really kind of, there's a part of me that's really not, I mean, with you guys, it's different, but like when we talk about the, you know, the various terms for it, but like the luminous, you know, the, that space of oneness, all of those transcendent states. I'm, there's a part of me that really isn't that interested in the transcendent states. And that's, that's not a pre-experiential transcend, you know, transcendental state. That's a post. Because I spent a long time really obsessed with that. And then I realized, wait a minute, we haven't, I, at least I personally, I haven't got my plumbing down. Foundations in my house are not down. Here I am just base jumping off the roof of the house, but I, I've got an unfinished basement. And that comes down to the attachment styles, the conflict styles, the, just the f opening your heart. Like, how does that get done? Like understanding the messages of emotions, you know, all these other hardwired programs that are literally predetermining life. These are very, in a way, they're quite simple things. They do take, they're hard. But so I just want to be really clear that for me, I, I keep going down where this book would go in the end, the whole kind of, you know, the, the, the end of the TED talk where it's like, all right, now do this would be a, kind of a list of what I've seen preliminarily. Can't hear. You, have you haven't already gone through. through. Frozen. Oh, did I freeze? Yeah. Now no, you're okay. Okay. You know, if you haven't gone through <clears throat> and literally untangled each one of these, Right in line, and we can we can we can say what will happen if you do, and what will happen if you don't. We could kind of literally predict certain ways that you will show up in relationships. You know, how many people are still marrying their mothers and fathers, and trying to kind of you know act out those relationships. <clears throat> um, you know, in in the unhealthy ways, of course. I mean, I see it all the time. I'm like, oh my, I, I didn't think it was as pandemic as you know. I think there was a time when I thought it was a literary trope. It's not. It's real. People are doing it all the time. So I'll kind of stop there. And thanks for, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for your feedback, John, as well. Thank you. So doesn't this come down to a question of, so in the final part of the article where you're arguing about this illumination and this transparency and, and integrity and these things, isn't it a question of transparency versus obscurity? I mean, um, you argue, I think, at one point in the paper, you argue that the Internet is both obscure and transparent, that it has these paradoxical elements in it. But at the end of the article, you focus more on the transparency issues. And even in what you're just talking about, um, you're talking about becoming aware of these emotional tropes that are going on underneath and that's a, a transparency issue um, but part of the reason why I why I have some difficulty with the end of the paper of the article is 
because it seemed to have lost the obscurity issue. And I think the obscurity issue is fundamental to what's going on today. It's not just about transparency. It's about the interplay between transparency and obscurity that are both present in different ways within the society that's emerging, right? And so it, it, it's how that interplay, I don't know, I'm just sort of throwing this out as a, a question well, about the, to the To the idea of the whistleblower that, that you bring in at the end mm -hmm. and this notion of, well, the, the, the identifying, you said you wrote this a while ago, it's before the Me Too movement and, you know, the, these, these really acute uh, movements culturally now around calling people out, exposing uh, bad behavior, um, holding people to account, uh, uh, using the internet, using the social media uh, to do so. Uh, I mean, the, the, the subtitle was, I mean, originally, I don't know if the title came up, but originally it was supposed to be the spiritual singularity and the coming age of transparency. And so, oh. I, and correct me if, if I hope, I'm not sure if I, I was really seeing that we were going to have certain individuals. We're not hearing you, Zachary. Could you could you restate that? Us to pull up our bootstraps. What was that title again? But of course, it's the coming age of transparency. transparency. Coming age of transparency. That was the it's, the it's, title that you rejected. Yeah. It's just that, again, you're valuing the transparency process and saying, well, obscurity is now drops onto the negative side of the thing. But in my books, obscurity is a very yeah, positive. That's a great and point. That's where, I'm having, that's where I'm having a little bit of difficulty with this. Uh, or privacy might be the term. That yeah. Current. No, there, there, I, yeah. I did have a whole piece around... Um, the difference between secrecy and privacy. So that might have in some ways at least ad addressed a little bit of it. I agree with you, Jeffrey. I'm certainly not for absolute transparency. I think we miss something when we do that, but I do, I made the distinction between privacy and secrecy privacy. We should all have, there is, should be a piece that is entirely of ours. That's you know, taken for granted. But unfortunately in this world, I think, we have far outplayed the secrecy card and that does need to be curbed in a lot of ways. Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead, Marco. Oh, no, I'm, I'm curious about uh, what Ed is noodling. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm following just fine. Here. You're cool. <laughs> no, I'm cool. I'm cool. <laughs> okay. Well, I didn't have a thought actually. Uh, <laughs> but you thought, <laughs> There, there's a lot that we're not, we're never going to know about people that we love very dearly and not because they're hiding things. Mm -hmm. It's because they've changed. And so, I mean, the last visit I had with my mother and my mother and I, I love her dearly, but we haven't gotten along most of our life. Most of our lifetime has been fraught with, with trouble. And she, she, and the, the man she married, I think was just a horrible human being. So yeah, you, that dynamic there, I'm taking care of mama. Um, but then, you know, I, I got out of there really early when I was a teenager, I left home and I did not look back, <clears throat> but I had, I had siblings who were, who stayed there and they, they, uh, they've taken care of my mother. Uh, and she's a very artistic person and she, she instilled artistic, uh, values and she recognized her artistic tendencies in me. So I, I'm a beneficiary of her, that, of her giving, of her mirroring that to me. And I'm very grateful. But the last time I saw her, um, I remember asking her some questions about her childhood and the things that she had told me about her relationship with her father, who was since deceased. And I, and I remember she said, oh, no, it didn't happen that way. It happened this way. So she had an alternative story to the story she told me when I was a child. And I have to say, oh, either, either I didn't remember the story that she told me correctly or she told me a story that she doesn't remember correctly uh, or that and there or that there's a new narrative that's emerging that uh, she's remembering now certain things that she didn't remember when she was a younger person 
and uh, nurturing me as a as a baby or as a uh, or as a toddler or as a teenager. So that's what I'm starting to learn is that it's not the people who are trying to deceive, although sometimes they are. It's that they may be self deceiving. They can't deceive mm-hmm. you unless they deceive themselves. So that's ha- that has to happen first. Yeah, and so when we're talking about transparent. I think it's not an you either transparent or you're opaque or you're transparent or you're lying. There's something in between. And I think, can we be transparent enough on, a, on enough occasions but so that we can see that there are multiple truths, multiple narratives. Um, there's archaic, magical, mythical, rational aspects for every person. And um, can we just uh, support one another and um, stay present as much as possible and breathe. You know, you know, my, you know what my mother said, Johnny? My mother recently said to me, you know, when your father was alive, I only remembered the bad things that he did. And then when he died, I've only remembered the good things. Right. That's a universal. I've heard that so many times. <laughs> Yeah. And I think she, she said it to me as if, as if it was something that I should compliment her about. But I have to say, it really just, all it did was bring a pit to my stomach. And I just thought, that is just, she, she really said it like she, it, was, it was some clever thing that she'd noticed. And I just thought that was tragic. It was incredibly tragic and, and actually kind of downright stupid. Yes, yes. And, and, you may be, and you may be right. But then who knows what's best for your yeah. mother? may not yeah. be what's best for you and the legacy yeah. is yours not hers yeah, yeah. So i have to take well, what they you... say and what they restay and what they distort and delete and just take all of it with a grain of salt because my memory is based upon my relationship with lots of different people who remember very different things about myself and about themselves yeah that's very puzzling and I've had to give up relationships because we, we didn't remember, we remembered things so differently mm-hmm. that I said, you know what? I cannot have a relationship with this person anymore yeah. because their memory is so different from mine. Yeah. And I don't want to live away in a way that has to conform to these memories that I don't believe are accurate. Yeah. That's a tough one. And I think it, you're right to voice some of these elements, but you're definitely talking about a certain part of relationships that are just always going to be very fractal and complicated um, and nuanced. And I, I agree with you, I guess. But one thing I think you hit the nail on the head with is, is, is that it does start with the self. And for me, where this all was coming to was really, it's, you know, these patterns of behavior, these codes of the psychograph, it's really all about transparency uh, uh, that we have with ourselves. Right, right. You know, and the degree to which we have seen that is the degree to which we can defend ourselves against, you know, the, the dark arts of corporate hypnosis and the degree to which we have not seen and made transparent our internal processes. We are simply at the whims of that buzz, that beep, that ding, and any other thing that we see popping up on our screen and regularly are, and it has proven to work. Right. And I, I totally agree with you there in your diagnosis. I think that that's something very similar to what Jordan Brown was saying to us through his di- documentary yeah. a few yeah. sessions back. Yeah. So. There into the lights, my pretties. Yeah. And, and John, you were describing right, the data architecture of the holo chain, uh, actually, because that, that idea of memory, I mean, that memory is essentially what a, a chain of data is in this computer model. I'm not trying to reduce one to the other. I'm just making an association, uh, noting a parallel uh, or an analog. Uh, and you, like when you said that you had to dissociate from this other person because their memory didn't you know, had diverged uh, so much from your own that you no longer could could share a common reality. You could, no longer could form that kind of slitter. Dickian uh, strong relationship or that sphere of, of mutuality, that's essentially the, the holo chain idea of an agent centric uh, model uh, where we can trust each other because I can trust that you know yourself. Uh, I, I can't verify you unless you can verify yourself. I have to trust your self verification essentially. And, and that's, that's the basis of 
a net, of the network, of the integrity uh, of the network. So I think, I think as long as we understand that part of what we're doing in language, we have to make, make these distinctions clear or at least assume not conflate one domain to the other, one discourse to the other, because the realm of our interiors is not a computer. That's a metaphor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that makes me feel so much I'm not alone. <laughs> Someone else. And I just want to say, I agree with that. I agree with that. But um, the, there is a contingent of behavior look very operational and very rote and does repeat itself oftentimes for decades. So, so that's, I, I, it's important to square both of those because I see that in that, my practice every day. And the it's way that like, we're coded, that we're programmed, that, that we act out scripts. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That, just that we are predetermined, that we are predetermined. And this, this relates to your, your thoughts on free will, which uh, mm -hmm. up in other contexts as well. Yeah. So why do I do anything at all if I'm predetermined? Why do I choose? Why do I think I choose? Why do I delude myself into thinking I should do something? I'm predetermined. We it's, all know that even, even down to our genes, the mutations that occur can be changed. I can, I can inherit things from my parents that I can change with my pre consciousness. Predetermined so, does not mean from the very get-go. That was Determin just said. Determinism is... There's a psychologist, he's deceased, Raymond Cattell, and he, he had a formula, and I used to know it all, and it was like 12 different things. And if you knew all 12 of those things, if you had that information, you could 100% predict what the person, how the person would react to the current situation. That's what determinism is. It isn't, and so, and this goes, John, to the, the illusion of free will. Free will is an illusion, but we just in your book. need it. We absolutely need it. Need it. Right. But I see that as a belief. You have a that belief. A belief. You can't yeah. prove it. You can say that for yourself, but yeah. I reject it as, a, as far, that's not my belief. And your belief and my belief, as far as I'm concerned, are just beliefs. Mm -hmm. I don't believe all of my beliefs. Some of them I believe because... <laughs> they're not a belief. Right, but I'm not, I'm not here to, uh, you know, uh, well, be well, subservient I'm, to your belief I'm system. Answering, I'm you know, answering and, Ed's question about determinism. It's that, and this, partly what Zach is saying is, where is it? Uh... And I want to make sure I clarify what I'm saying. Well, mm -hmm. I, I, I do. I take, I it's take not the, easy to clarify. This is hard. Here, here, it's a quote. That which you are unconscious of will control you. I do, I do believe that. I mean, that's a, you know, it's a, it's I mean, a that's not 100%. Okay. Yeah. I'm, not I'm, not that. I'm not arguing that. I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing the notion of predeterminism. Predeterminism says it cannot be changed. It is determined. It will well, happen it, this way. It can be changed right up to the moment you do it. And oh, once again, I, it, once but once I do something else and it's not predetermined. Well, what? But that is I, determined I take a, I, by all that which happened prior to the event. Let's get Sam Harrison involved in this. Well, what yeah, happens? Yeah, to him anyway. <laughs> okay. What happens, like what, 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 what happens to novelty? What happens to emergence? Wait, 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 let Zachary tell us what the predeterminism. Yeah, I, I guess yeah. the, the way I like want to have this conversation is outside of our pre-existing understandings of 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 the philosophical terms of predeterminism and free will and others. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. All I've seen in my own life, uh, in my personal life, in my clinical practice, is. Once again, these certain items, once again, taken from certain traumas that are huge trends in all of our lives to varying degrees, um, will not exactly, but predetermine um, how uh, a woman responds in a moment of conflict in her family, with her father, in her business, in Whole Foods, on the street when someone cuts her over. She may not behave in exactly the same way every single time. 
Mm-hmm. But odds are, seventy percent of the time, mm-hmm. she's going to lean left because that's mm-hmm. that's that's where the original okay. foundation in her house mm-hmm. had a jackhammer taken to it. Th- that's okay. very simple. That's observational. Now, it, you know, but at that's the same not time, the individual. That's a statistical aggregate of, mm-hmm. of people. Well, no, who it's, share it's that, those well. I, I see it as the individual as well because it'll be a statistical aggregate in the individual life as well. It will lean the life into a certain direction. Exactly. To your point, to your point, John, if if you breathe, if you can get everybody to do that before they act, that comes before the act. If you can get them to breathe, then they can do something other than what they did before. That's right. That's right. Yeah. My father didn't have to hit me over and over and over and over and over again. He didn't have to beat the shit out of my mother over and over and over and over and over again, but he did. Theoretically. Until I hit him back. When I was a teenager and I was strong enough, I hit him back and he stopped hitting me. I don't think any of that was predetermined. And now that I'm a grown man and he's been dead and gone, his influence over me has changed. It's not totally neutral. I do not love him and I never will. But that's, that's not predetermined either. I could love him if I thought about it. That's because your story changed. You just said that like 15 minutes ago, that, that where you are right now, you've never been there before. I am more than my trauma, and so are you, and so are all of us. We've all been that? traumatized. I am more than my trauma. Of course. This is true. This is true. And I can act in novel and innovative ways. And I have done so. And so have people around me. They have surprised me and shocked me. And sometimes they've profoundly disappointed me because I didn't expect something that they did, that they did do. So that's just life. You don't know know all of their history. If you did, you could predict their behavior. I don't know Ah. all of this. How in the world? Don't go there. No, no, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't no, that, that, that's precisely what doesn't emergent follow. knowledge. There's a place for emergent knowledge. It's very mysterious how it arises, but it does. And it happens all the time if you pay attention to it. And if you expect it, you can create conditions for it. That's where I believe our personal agency is we can develop our agency so that we can expect these innovations and these uh, emergences. And we can create conditions for them that are more beneficial rather than disruptive. So I, I want think to hear Ed. Will is very important. Uh, I want to thank uh, Zachary for clarifying what he was, what he meant when he said predetermined. Uh, you helped reinforce that, Mark, as well. Um, the chances are very good that things will go a certain way, but you cannot predict that it will happen because, in my world. At that last moment before it happens, I can choose otherwise. In that moment, my behavior is not predetermined. It was pre-guided and it was pre-informed and it was pre, and, and this is what I hear Zachary saying. In most, nine times out of 10, you know, all st- 75% of all statistics are made up on the spot. And nine times out of 10, people will behave like they always behave, but you can behave differently. Well, and, if you and this can, behaving differently, excuse me, let, just let me finish the sentence. This behaving differently is not an illusion to me. Well, 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 here's just to throw in something, just to throw in something about that. For to, just uh, oftentimes to, to behave differently means going against an impulse that actually feels good and right. That's mm-hmm. right. It actually means going against what feels right. I see this all the yeah. time too. So it's like you're actually yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. at the moment. That's a very, very tricky thing to do. Yeah. My, yeah. Brother, my yeah. brothers with children, my, yeah. I have two brothers who had children, and they were beat up just as I was by a father. And when they became fathers, they've told me, and I met their children, and I believe them. They said they've never hit their kids. Mm-hmm. They would never do to their kids what their father had done to them. So that's why I say this. there's a lot of wiggle room and we are hardwired to transcend. Sure, sure. It's sure. not, a, it's not, a, it does, it happens. And people do change. And I'm just talking about my family is a very traumatized family, but we still have, there's a lot of talent in our family and we can still emerge, new talents can emerge. And I think on a, there are 
are tribes and societies and, you know, with lots of different uh, fragmented groups that are seeking some sort of uh, wholeness. And I believe we should uh, create conditions where that might happen. And I think I do agree with, with Marco that this is probably happening on a scale that's never happened before, but that it has happened many, 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 many times. I believe uh, there's been novelty and unusual events occur and people have been uh, stressed and up against it just as we are now. And, um, you know, I think that we may have advantages that they did not have as well. Like more of us may have clean drinking water than previous populations have had. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm very optimistic in some ways, but I don't want to get trapped into optimism or, or pessimism. I'm sort of, it's a very fluid, dynamic situation. So I just hope we can create conditions for what we value. And I think it's going to start small. It's going to start in small groups like ours. I don't think it's going to happen in Congress. I don't think it's going to be happening at, at Yale or Harvard or at the World Bank. I think, though, that as Gidley says, more and more people become invested in this idea of a, a post-rational phase that those persons who try to put some flesh on that are going to be making things change. And our educational systems, if there are enough people who want these kinds of changes, will change those systems. So I, I believe that, that more and more of that kind of positive change can happen, but it won't happen without our participation. And, and there's there needs to be space for paradox and a paradoxical logic as well. We're hardwired to transcend and we could predict our unpredictability. And that's kind of weird. <laughs> so, um, we're almost at the top of the hour. Ooh, already. And I just wanted to say that I, I could predict with 70% accuracy that you were, all of you would say exactly what you just said. So. <laughs> I uh, only you could. <laughs> I think maybe we're practicing our free will. You know, maybe that maybe that's uh, an, an an element of this. Maybe that's an implication of this is that free will doesn't come free, uh, and that uh, uh, there's a. I agree with that. I think it has tremendous costs. Painful. Costs, costs that actually prevent individuals, anybody from really even going in that direction. There's collateral damage left, right, and center, I think, when we step on that bridge. Eric, you said earlier that, um, or I think it was maybe Mark quoting you, but, but the comment was that when we are unconscious of our actions, that's when they control us, right? So the flip side of that is that the more we become conscious of who we are and what's going on, that's when the possibility for acting in non-controlled ways emerges. So I think uh, it, it's a little bit, uh, not entirely Freudian, but... Um, well, also just to add into that, that way. I, I think the, okay, the structure of the pattern has to be understood. Like the alternative pattern to the existing pattern has to be understood. That's like an architecture. But then let's say if that is originated from the original wound, the original wound stays there and isn't really fully healed. That crosswind pushing us left is always gonna be there. So for me, there are several elements to it. There is like the healing of the original thing that kind of pushed it to swerve it left. There's the understanding of the alternative to the pattern itself. And then there's just the courageous action of like seizing the moment when it arrives in life. So I'm with you, but this, you know, and I think, of course, breathing is part of it. Like actually being physically in your body is part of it. So there's a lot to it, I find. You have to smack someone once in a while. A bully needs to be smacked. <laughs> Absolutely. And after, it's, and after he starts behaving better, you start to say, hey, that was a good thing. But there's no guarantee. And that's where I'm like, you know, our presence you know, of mind, you know, you know we may we create situations that are painful. Situations of course in terms of this johnny you, you're um you, you're not a you're a, an exceptional example in this case i think um compared to the, the mass of individuals 
visuals that I'm talking about. So a wonderfully exceptional example, um, but uh, definitely uh, an exception to the, to the, to the general rule. My, yeah, my, my therapy, yeah, my okay. therapy. I, I would be in a loony bin. Most loony bin have my experience or have been put away. But you know, <laughs> I, know I guess I was lucky. I had a great peer People who loved me. So it can happen. Hmm. All right. So where does this leave us? Are we any closer to the human singularity? <laughs> I think it already happened. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't notice it. That's all. <laughs> well, I think we've shot through singularities. I don't know about the human singularity, but I prefer the multiple singularity idea rather than <laughs> single singularity. Well, I just want to, I, I really enjoyed your paper, Zachary. And I think, yeah, you, you, in I don't know, five thousand words, you tried to put jam a book into five thousand words or three books. So, and, but it was it, it was a pleasure to uh, get inside your mind a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I hope it wasn't too much of a nightmare, but yeah, I really appreciate no, it. No, it's great. It was great. That was a good conversation. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. Had a lot of fun reading and talking. Good job, Marco. <laughs> oh, good job, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity, Marco. And thanks, everyone, for, for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. It means a lot. All right. Okay. Well, bye. Bye. Till next time. Blessing. <laughs>